On October 7th, 1929, the Los Angeles Times ran a chilling headline. Child sacrificed in ritual of cults, body and casket at foster parents' home in Los Angeles, preserved in ice, expected resurrection, authorities told by high priestess. The unfortunate girl in question was 16-year-old Willa Rhodes. Alongside her body were found the corpses of seven dogs. Now, when her foster parents, Mr. and Mrs. William Rhodes, were asked when Willa died, the police received a shocking answer. The girl had been dead for four years. So why hadn't her death been reported or her body buried? The Rhodeses admitted that they hoped she would be brought back to life by the Great Eleven Club cult, otherwise known as the Divine Order of the Royal Arms of the Great Eleven. It was also called the Blackburn Cult, as it had been founded in 1922 by May Otis Blackburn. Now, the Blackburn Cult began in downtown Los Angeles on Bunker Hill with a satellite location and retreat in Southern California's Simi Valley. Now, May began the movement after claiming to receive visions of angels. Along with her daughter, Ruth Velen Rizzio, May was convinced that she was receiving secret knowledge of the universe, including the end of the world, the mysteries of heaven and earth, and the boundary between life and death itself. Now, May and Ruth had been specifically selected for this mission by the Archangel Gabriel himself. That's a pretty big claim. Now, it was Gabriel who the Rhodes family believed would resurrect their daughter. In fact, the LA Times would write this. The dogs had been pets of the dead girl, and according to the story told by Mrs. Rhodes, represented the seven tones of Gabriel's trumpet, which the cultists expected to proclaim resurrection mourn. Police suspicion was directed to the Rhodes home after two other members of the cult, Mrs. Otis Blackburn, the high priestess, and her daughter, Mrs. Ruth Angelina V. Lind Rizzio, had been held on charges of embezzling about $50,000 from persons who had contributed to the organization which bore the name of the Divine Order of the Royal Arm of the Great Seal. Willa's official cause of death was recorded as diphtheria, although there are lingering suspicions that she was poisoned by Mae Blackburn as a deliberate sacrifice. Now, after passing away on January 1st, 1925, Willa was then wrapped in a white blanket, placed in a copper-lined cedar casket built by William Rhodes himself, covered in ice, and then transported from house to house as the family relocated. Now, it took 600 pounds of ice each week to prevent her body from starting the decay process. And when Willa's body was discovered, the Blackburn cult was already under investigation by authorities. They had been accused of fraud, depriving some victims of sums of up to $40,000, all to fund the publication of a book they planned on releasing entitled The Great Sixth Seal. Now, it was in this book that May Blackburn planned to reveal her contact with Gabriel, as well as the secret to raising the dead and ever the capitalist where to find more gold and oil beneath America. Now, in addition to suspected human sacrifice, the Blackburn cults also slaughtered animals in the name of their belief. One of the more famous instances involved driving 500 miles out across the Mojave Desert to Death Valley. There, at Stovepipe Wells, May Blackburn told two carloads of her followers that the desert held a bottomless pit, the entrance to the underworld. Researchers suspect May was referring to the structure known as Devil's Hole, which is a thermal well in Death Valley, where she is believed to have deposited some of her sacrifices, including humans, dogs, and a pair of mules she named the Jaws of Death. Now, however, May Blackburn served little time for her crimes. 
The only charges that stuck were eight counts of grand theft, but even these failed to hold up to judicial scrutiny. Now, by the time she was freed from custody, the divine order of the royal arms of the Great Eleven was in decline, thanks in part to the publicity surrounding the murder and disappearances. May Blackburn died on June 17, 1951 in Los Angeles. Now, according to those in the Blackburn cult, May went by titles like Queen May and the Heel of God. She ruled her family and followers like a tyrant. And in fact, it was her daughter's acting career that brought the family to Los Angeles where they found fertile ground for their religious movement. Now, of all the cities in the United States of America, Few can match Los Angeles in terms of what many of us would call fringe religious beliefs. Even the LA Times has asked the question, does LA have an addiction to cults and cultists? Sure, seems like it. No other community on the face of the globe has given rise to half as many mystic, philosophical, psychological, occult, consciousness, raising, therapeutic, and alternative creeds as 20th century Los Angeles. Now, the reasons for this are plentiful. Los Angeles attracts its share of powerful and wealthy people, and there certainly seems to be a correlation between those qualities and satanic cults. Now, the weather is probably partially to blame as well. I mean, many people view California's climate as a peaceful paradise, and there are hopes that this outer peace might foster an inner peace. Now, another factor is that, as in the second largest city in the entire country, the sheer density of people is bound to bring with it, well, let's just say a lot of diverse beliefs. The Los Angeles area is home to the world headquarters for Scientology, many of you already know what that is, a religious movement which many have deemed a cult. More infamously, it was also where the Manson family unleashed its murder and mayhem in the late 1960s. Now, alongside these more famous instances of fringe religious belief, a number of other cults have flourished in the City of Angels. Now, in contrast to the Blackburn cults, most of these religious movements seem just plain silly. I mean, Los Angeles' affinity for cults stretches back into the 19th century. Now, one of, if not the first religious sects in the region was founded by Scotsman William Money back in 1841. Now, although he originally came to town as a manual laborer helping to repair churches, Williams soon found that people latched onto him with alarming ease. Now, this is partially due to the fact that William was what we would describe as a renaissance man or polymath, someone who had a lot of diverse interests. And in addition to being well-read on a variety of subjects, he was a self-proclaimed child prodigy William also claimed to offer a number of successful remedies. In fact, after a smallpox epidemic had hit the Los Angeles region in the 1860s, the number of patients who believed he had cured them led to a massive following. Now, William claimed to have healed at least 5,000 people. He soon announced that he was a bishop of the reform of the New Testament church, Los Angeles' earliest cult. Among the many things that he claimed, William asserted that a massive underground ocean was bound to swallow up San Francisco and it would destroy Los Angeles too if people didn't follow not God's law, his law specifically. Now, eventually, William's wild predictions became too much for people to ignore. Some local townsfolk eventually captured him, shoved him in a box, and began burying this guy alive. Now, the last straw was his proclamation that he could raise the dead. Apparently, William didn't have faith in his own abilities because he kept shouting, for the love of God, let me out, until he was finally released. William Money died in 1881 at San Gabriel's Money and Institute in his own elaborate bed. Its headboard and footboard were carved with the Virgin Mary and a skeleton, respectively. Now, shortly after his death, another cult would rise to prominence in the area. Atop a hill in northeast Los Angeles' Glusell Park, 
Edith Maida Lessing would establish a compound here in the early 1920s that she named Mount Helios after the ancient Greek sun god. Rumors began to spread around town about revels and weird rituals at the site inspired by the crimson love flag. Edith's followers flew, and it soon came out that Edith was the leader of a love cult, if there's even such a thing, and claimed control over a thousand men. She could often be seen parading across the top of Mount Helios in her purple gold-trimmed robes, a stark contrast to her followers who lived in shacks and tents. Here, she would preach a message of free love, universal childcare, abolishing civil marriage, profit sharing, free trade, and free transportation. Is she uh, running for office here, or is this actually a religious cult? As lurid as these rumors were, law enforcement had more grave concerns to attend. They might have left the Mount Helios cult alone if they weren't distributing leaflets advocating for revolution. Now this, coupled with her socialist leanings and 1917's October Revolution in Russia, it did make authorities anxious. Now in 1922, Mount Helios was raided and the cults eventually disbanded. Now while the Mount Helios cult may be gone, another Los Angeles movement from the same era still lingers today. Folks, in 1906, a man calling himself Ottoman Tsar Adusht Hanish visited Los Angeles from Chicago and began lecturing about sun worship. The man, whose real name was Ernest Otto Hanish, was the leader of a religious movement known as Mazdaznin. Now, Mazdaznin's practices included vegetarian diets, fasting, personal responsibility, and breath work, the control of one's breathing for spiritual enlightenment. Otto called this Galama. Now, technically, Mazdaznin wasn't Otto's invention. It was actually the revival of a 6th century Zoroastrian practice known as Mazdakism. Now, Otto took these older ideas and combining the Persian words Mazda and Zanon, combined them to create a religion he translated as Master Thought. Mazdaznin might have begun in Chicago, but it took root after Otto moved to LA. Here, however, he soon ran afoul of the law. Relatives of a cult member, hearing that a boy in their family was subsiding solely on grapes and beer, asked police to investigate the cults. So Otto and his movement were in and out of the criminal cases in the years between the world wars. Now these legal battles included taking advantage of minors, indecent exposure, practicing medicine without a license, and a case involving a German officer who actually sued Otto and the Mazdaznans for enticing his wife away. Now, despite these legal troubles, vestiges of the Mazdazen can still be seen today. In central Los Angeles Arlington Heights neighborhood, Otto's Temple, a Greek revival building, still stands there. But it isn't just the infrastructure that remains. In 2007, a Peter DeBoer, who's a retired business owner in Canada, revived the core tenets of the Mazdaznin focusing on breathwork. Peter told newspapers that he was always interested in healing and taking control of one's own body by proper breathing and eating. So how far do you breathe? How much do you breathe in? He claimed that people didn't get enough in their system. While Mazdaznin drew upon their ancient past, other cults in Los Angeles found their inspiration beyond the stairs. The American Southwest and Southern California have long been regarded as UFO hotspots, and the most profound sightings sometimes leave an impact on the region's religious landscape. Now, one of the more famous UFO religions with ties to Los Angeles is the infamous I Am Activity Movement. The cult was founded by flying saucer contactee Guy Ballard in the early 1930s. Now, Ballard was inspired to found I Am based on his alleged personal experiences. In the 1930s, he was hiking California's Mount Shasta when he beheld a vision of a being who identified itself as the Count Saint Germain. The Count offered Ballard a cup filled with pure electronic essence and drinking it, Ballard was consumed by what he called a white flame, which formed a circle about 50 feet in diameter. 
The Count and his companion then took an astral tour of miraculous cities buried beneath such locations like Yellowstone, the Amazon, and the Grand Tetons. Now, at this final location, Ballard met the Lords of Flame, a dozen ascended masters from the planet Venus who entranced their visitor with a musical recital and a miraculous mirror that showed images from their home world. Now, upon his return home, Guy Ballard and his wife Edna founded the I Am Activity Movement. The cult headquarters in Los Angeles featured an imposing tabernacle downtown, which prominently bore the words I am in gleaming neon sign at the top. Here, Ballard would channel his Venusian contacts, including a being he associated with, Jesus Christ, known as Sananda. Actually, I think it's Sananda. Anyway, most of the teachings center around reincarnation. The movement seeks to normalize itself by calling itself both Christian and patriotic. I mean, after all, they claim Sananda is basically Jesus and the Count of St. Germain guided the Declaration of Independence. Ballard continued relaying these and other messages from Sananda until his death in 1939, after which Edna took over all lines of communication. Now, like other cults, I.M. became a target for law enforcement. In fact, in 1942, Edna and her son were convicted of fraud, a decision that was later overturned in a landmark Supreme Court decision. The court decreed that whether or not the Ballards believed their own religious convictions, it should have been irrelevant to their case, which originally hinged upon the matter. Today, I Am still exists, though it has relocated from Los Angeles. The organization is headquartered in a place you probably didn't expect, Schaumburg, Illinois, though it still has a reading room in Mount Shasta. There is also a 12-story tall I Am temple in downtown Chicago. Now, to understand our next prominent Los Angeles UFO cults, we must first take a look at the man who founded it. George King, another contactee who claimed communication with non-human intelligences. Born in 1919, George was working as a cab driver in London when a strange disembodied voice popped into his head and it announced this. Prepare yourself. You are to become the voice of the interplanetary parliament. Okay. Eight days later, George claimed that a vision of a Hindu male religious teacher, or Swami, materialized in his flat. This visionary being taught George all he needed to know about tantric yoga and the secrets of the universe and commanded that he form an organization to set humanity on the proper path to enlightenment. Soon, George King claimed that the ability to contact residents of Venus, a basic message that they brought him was that an order of ascended holy beings had battled their evil counterparts who wished to enslave all the residents of Earth. The good guys were known as the Great White Brotherhood, although it sounds pretty dodgy in 2023. The white wasn't a reference to the race, but rather than being the powers of light standing against the darkness. Now, George would later claim a trip to one of the moons of Mars, where he would encounter an alien dwarf that fired a ray gun at him. His injuries beyond repair, George psychically projected himself back to London, where he and a group of acquaintances he called excellent spiritual healers nursed him back to health. Now, this wasn't George's only trip to Mars, however. He later claimed another mission to save Earth from an impending asteroid collision. Tragically, 174 Martians lost their lives defending our planet from the evil asteroid dwarves. Back home, George King's work was far from done with the help of information received by a Venetian named Master Atherius. George soon enlisted a legion of followers. This became known as the Aetherius Society. With headquarters in London and Los Angeles, the goal of this movement is, in their words, a spiritual one, since it is definitely known that the mission of the Flying Saucers and their crews to Earth is a spiritual mission. The primary way that the Aetherius Society battles evil in the world is by changing what became known as spiritual energy. 
or prayer batteries, which apparently hold up to 700 hours of positive intention that can be used over the course of 10,000 years to apparently dispel darkness from the universe. Much of their time, energy, and religious fervor is spent on ensuring that these batteries remain fully charged. In fact, according to the Aetherius Society, the process goes like this. For two hours, Aetherius members join together in a powerful ritual using dynamic prayer, Eastern mantra, and mystic mudras. The energy they invoke is collected and stored in a radionic battery. These charging sessions continue week after week, filling each battery with thousands of hours of prayer energy. Whenever there is a disaster on Earth in need of spiritual energy, such as a hurricane, earthquake, or war, this store of uplifting healing energy can be released almost immediately through a spiritual energy radiator. This radionic device can discharge a battery in a fraction of the time it took to charge it. This concentrated prayer energy is then manipulated by cooperating masters to the area in need. Since we started this mission in 1973, we have had astounding successes aiding victims of catastrophes and other natural disasters. Operation Prayer Power Charging Sessions are open to anyone who is willing to expend the necessary effort to learn and practice the holy mantras used as a powerful way to help humanity. Now, George King would go on to pass away on July 12th, 1997 in his Santa Barbara home. His legacy, though, lives on for a very, very long time. And today, the Los Angeles headquarters for the Aetherius Society still stands and is attended by a group of devoted followers. Compared to other Los Angeles cults, the Aetherius Society is incredibly open to the public. The members welcome visitors, regardless of their belief, so long as you let them know you're coming and show proper respect. As already mentioned, you can even attend a ritual and help charge the prayer batteries. You might even find yourself witnessing something strange afterward, that there are claims that flying saucer sightings spike in the aftermath of a battery charging ceremony. Now, if this episode isn't sci-fi or X-Files enough for you, it's about to get a lot more strange because the Aetherius Society is relatively small with only a few thousand members, mostly spread throughout the United States, United Kingdom, and New Zealand, our next cult, however, is much more widespread. One of the biggest cults with a strong presence in Los Angeles is the veneration of Nuestra Señora de la Santa Muerte, which in Spanish means Our Lady of the Holy Death. While not officially recognized by the Catholic Church, in fact, the Church condemns the cult, she springs out of the Catholic tradition, if you know what I mean. Santa Muerte, who is a personification of death itself, not unlike the Grim Reaper, can broadly be referred to as a folk saint, a figure, person, or entity who is not canonized, but nonetheless revered by a segment of the population. Now, followers of Santa Muerte believe that she has the power to influence their lives. In addition to seeing her devotees and their enemies safely to the afterlife, Santa Muerte is believed to have the ability to heal and protect those who follow her. Depictions of Santa Muerte often show a skeleton in feminine clothing, wielding objects like scythes and globes. In fact, some of her other names include Most Holy or Most Saintly Death the bony lady, and Senora de las Sombras, which is Lady of Shadows. Her origins are not entirely clear. She seems to stem from a mixture of pre-Columbian and Catholic tradition. The same mixture of belief with an emphasis on death can be seen in the Day of the Dead celebrations all throughout Mexico. Unlike those popular festivities, worship of Santa Morte is a much more private affair. There's evidence of Santa Morte devotion in Mexico as early as the 1940s. However, it is only since 2001 that the movement truly gained traction throughout North America. The cult of Santa Morte first came to America around 2005, brought here by Latin American immigrants. 
Now, as of 2012, it was estimated that tens of thousands of people in the country followed Santa Muerte. Some claim it is the fastest growing new religious movement in the Americas. Today, the cult has taken root throughout the United States with pockets of followers easily found in communities with very high migrant populations. For the most part, Santa Muerte worship is informal, mostly confined to small shrines and altars in private residences and businesses. So the next time you visit your local gas station, keep an eye out. You might very well see a Santa Muerte shrine behind the counter or maybe in the back room. It is also becoming easier and easier to spot Santa Morte merchandise at stores, I mean, even at larger chains like Walmart. Take a look through the votive candles and t-shirts on the shelves. You may very well find a female skeleton, in all likelihood meant to represent Santa Morte. Now, while many of her followers are peaceful, Santa Muerte worship can be found extensively throughout populations who lead more dangerous lifestyles. Those who often face violence and death can easily be drawn into her influence. Now, for this reason, Santa Muerte worship is popular in prisons, both among inmates and guards with shrines popping up in prison cells. Now, the cult of Santa Muerte is exceptionally popular among Mexican drug cartels. Many law enforcement officers conducting raids on drug houses in Mexico and the United States all find altars and images of Saint Death. Some of the more famous cartel members known for following Santa Muerte are El Mocha Arejas, which is the nickname for kidnapper Daniel Arismendi Lopez, and the boss of the Gulf Cartel, Gilberto Garcia Mena. Now, again, it's important to reiterate that many, if not most, civilian practitioners of Santa Muerte are peaceful. However, there is a darker side. Sonora State Police announced in March of 2012 that they had arrested eight people in conjunction with the deaths of a woman and two 10-year-old boys. Their investigation concluded that the deaths were meant as a human sacrifice to Santa Muerte. As we have said, most Santa Muerte devotees practice in private. There are a few places, however, where worship is not only out in the open, but available to the public and celebrated. The largest and most visible population of Santa Muerte worshipers in America can be found, guess where guys, in Los Angeles. The city has 15 religious groups dedicated to Saint Death, including the most famous, the Temple of Santa Muerte. And this temple actually sits in East Hollywood on Melrose Avenue. While open to the public, photography is prohibited without permission. Now, the temple itself is rather small. There's only room for about 20 or so people to sit at any given time, but it is brimming with depictions of Santa Morte. These include fully dressed, life-sized statues which preside over an ever-shifting array of flowers, candles, and offerings of fresh fruit. Now, the candles have a special significance depending on their color. For example, gold asks for Santa Muerte to intercede in business, red in love, white for domestic problems, black for protection. Individual offerings carry meaning as well. Water is good for getting yourself heard, but tequila is better. Your offering might be tied to one of the elements. If it involves the air, say a safe airplane trip, a cigar will suffice. If it involves the earth, like laying the foundations for a new house, then salt might help or soil from your birthplace. Now, services are held twice daily, Friday through Sunday, and if you attend, you can listen to a sermon from one of the priests who might explain that Santa Morte, contrary to her designation as a folk saint by academics, is not a human construct. She is a deity, just like any other combination of the Judeo-Christian angel of death and the Aztec goddess of the underworld, known as Miktikes Hualt. One of the popular reoccurring chances angel created by faith allow the power in me to be released. Now, attendance at Los Angeles Santa Morte shrines has become quite diverse over the years, with the congregation representing people of every conceivable background and ethnicity. 
While Santa Muerte might seem intimidating to outsiders, many of her followers seem at peace with her presence. As Miguel Velasco, who's a spiritual guide at El Verado Street's Sanctuario Universal de la Santa Muerte, said, everything depends on oneself. You can believe in God or a saint or even a tree. But what really matters is the faith you have. Faith can move mountains. The priest of the Alvarado Street location, Santiago Guadalupe, said this. Years ago, they used this for witchcraft to get certain things, money or revenge. Now it is more religion. It is about health and prayer. People come for their jobs, for good luck at the casinos, or for problems with a husband or wife. In Mexico, more came because they were having problems in their family. Here, they come because they feel alone. Santa Muerte accepts them no matter their age, creed, or color. She is accepting of all religions. While Santa Muerte is focused so much on death, another Los Angeles-based cult was primarily focused on life and all of its pleasures. In the late 1960s, James Edward Baker, who was a disciple of the Sikh spiritual leader Yogi Bhajan, founded the Source family. Baker, who would later change his name to Yahowah, or more commonly, Father Yod, lived an adventurous life prior to founding the cult, or at least he claimed to. Born in Cincinnati in 1922, he said that he was awarded the Silver Star while serving in the Marine Corps during World War II, became a master of jujitsu, and moved to Hollywood to audition for Tarzan or to become a stuntman. In reality, there is no record of him ever receiving the Silver Star, but he did become a successful restaurateur, owning such LA landmarks as the Aware Inn, the Old World, and the most famous establishment, the Source Restaurant. After changing his name, Father Yod established the Source family. The group, which included Father Yod's wives, subsided off earnings from the restaurant, living together in a mansion located in Los Feliz. Their primary focus was on organic vegetarian diets, natural medicine, utopian ideals, and communal living, and a six-count inhalation of the sacred herb. You know what I'm talking about. That and breasts. Lots and lots of breasts. At its height, 150 people lived at the Los Feliz property, including Father Yod's 14 brides. We have Makushla, we have Harvest Moon, we have Galaxy, we have Lovely, we have Isis, we have Astral, we have Heaven, we have Prism, we have Aquariana, we have Peralda, Hypatia, Tantaleo, Venus, and his legal wife, Robin Popper, who took the name Elm, or I guess it could be pronounced Ahom. Now, in 1974, the Source family moved to Hawaii. Father Yod died in a hang gliding accident on August 25th, 1975, survived by his wives. Today, they claim to still be in contact with their spiritual husband. In 2023, Isis, who is now 80 years of age, said that he's still the big guy to me, still my man, and when you live in both dimensions, the veil is very thin. Like Father Yod himself, the Source family continues to live on. An article from the LA Times discussed how, on March 25th, 2023, Atlas Obscura sponsored a private dinner with several celebrities, including Rick Rubin, joined former Source family members to discuss the cult roots of health food. The menu included items inspired by the Source restaurant. Aaron Osman of the LA Times wrote that the meal was this. Featured seven courses, including psychedelic toast, multi-dimensional soup, and a recreation of the restaurant's aware salad served by staff engaged in Source family cosplay, dressed in flowing white frocks and wigs. Isis and fellow Source family members, Venus, Zarathustra, and Galaxy Aquarian blessed the meal with a ritual they performed in the family. As above, so below and around, we go, Yahowah, they chanted with corresponding hand gestures, as if guiding energy around the 40-person table decorated with poppies, dill flowers, wheat and cut papaya, a flower child's rendering of a medieval banquet. 
The interest of these celebrities doesn't end there. Mark Ruffalo, who is one of the attendees, is working on a limited series where he will play Father Yod himself. No information on when it'll be ready for you to watch. Although, do we really want to? We have only scratched the surface of cults in Los Angeles. It seems like new ones pop up every day. So why does Southern California attract so many odd beliefs? Are they just seeking greater meaning in life, like so many of us, or is there something more sinister at play? Maybe a deep abiding force tethered to the very land itself, one that provides fertile ground for all manner of strange sex to flourish. You tell me. And because you guys made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below what lurks beneath Los Angeles so I know who made it to the end of the video. If you guys enjoyed today's video, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more content just like this one. And as always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll catch you guys in the very next episode.